Hello and welcome to this joint webinar hosted by Care Control and Pain Check. We're here today to discuss how AI and digital technology support improved outcomes in dementia care. I'm now going to hand over to one of our hosts, Marcus Stevenson. Over to you. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, hello. Welcome to our webinar. This is distinctly about um, our AI technology, digital transformation, and how technology works within the healthcare. So it's great to have everybody here. Uh, we're hosting, I said, Care Control hosting today. We've got a number of guest speakers on with us. So um, I firstly want to sort of quickly whiz through who we've got on the line. We've got uh, obviously myself, Marcus Stevenson, as I've been introduced. We've got uh, Tandeep, who's our head of business, not for us, but for Paincheck, head of business uh, development for Paincheck. We've also got Zeta, who is the operations director for Angel Care and MNS uh, Care PLC. And we're also joined by Paula Cashmore, who is uh, an independent care quality consultant, but Paula has also recently opened up her own business, which is called the Achievable Care Quality Community. So it's fantastic to have these people with us on today's call. We're gonna run through, as we talked about, the impact of AI and digital tech in uh, dementia care. Really important. Uh, Paula and Zita are gonna have some time talking a little bit about how that, uh, tech care has been adopted within to the angel care and MMS uh, care itself and that's going to be quite interesting so I think stick around for that it's going to be some good debate in there and then we'll close out by talking about how AI and digital tech really supports the CQC standards and, and the quality statements and then we'll have some uh, potential Q&A at the end and some closing so hope that frames it for you guys today really great to have you all here and uh, really excited to talk about what we're going to be delivering today. So I want to introduce Tandeep, uh, and Tandeep's going to, he's, he's a big boy, he can introduce himself. So Tandeep, welcome, welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Marcus, and, and it's, I'm delighted to be here um, to, I guess, share what we've done at PainCheck, but also um, the unique integration we have here with Care Control. Um, so look, my background um, is, is, is from a clinical background. I'm, I'm a pharmacist, um, but at the moment I'm, I'm heading up um, business development here at PainCheck. And I guess PainCheck is, is, is one of the first successful uses of AI technology in the care sector. And I really wanna kind of hone in on this and, 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 and share with you actually what is PainCheck? Fabulous. Listen, exciting sector as well, right, for you guys and a lot of growth at the moment. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll um we'll 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 cover this off in the webinar in terms of you know what what our growth has been like, but essentially how we're actually delivering really good outcomes um through the use of the technology um to help enable carers. Um, deliver better dementia care. And that's really the focus, you know, for, for today. So look, what is pain check? You know, pain check, I guess, is used to address the fact that pain, pain is difficult. It's difficult to assess. It's, it's, it's difficult to monitor, even more so for people who cannot verbalize their pain. Um, so our, our purpose here at pain check is to give a voice actually to people who cannot reliably verbalize their pain, such as people living with dementia, but also that extends to people that are living with learning disabilities or accessing mental health services, essentially anyone who's got lost the cognition to be able to um, share their in pain. And we know currently um, there's some challenges with uh, with uh, with pain management and pain assessment across the sector, and PainCheck um, aims to address some of them, and we'll cover that off on on, on the webinar now. But um, look, PainCheck is a mobile app, right? It it comes in the form of a medical device, and um, I guess um, this is where it becomes really fascinating because PainCheck uses a combination of AI and human intervention. So the AI element um, uses a camera on the smart device um, to identify facial movements that we all have when we're in pain. But actually for people living with dementia, these movements are more heightened, so it's more sensitive. And the AI is then combined with the human intervention. Um, and essentially that guides the carer through what we call a checklist of other pain indicators. We look at the voice, the movement, the activity, behavior, and body. It's a multi-dimensional approach to, to pain assessments. And essentially that tells us then how bad the pain is in the form 
of a severity score. The process is rapid, you know, it only takes a couple of minutes and and pain scores are actually documented, not just at the point of care within the app, but also within an online analytics and evidence portal. But we also recognise the importance of data consistency, data integrity across different clinical systems, which is why we're proudly integrated um, with Care Control, um, you know, where pain data moves seamlessly um, into care control and essentially helping uh, multidisciplinary teams, care staff with, you know, decisions, supporting those decisions, essentially. But, but all in all, you know, with four million assessments now completed globally using pain check, it just shows how well the technology is being used. And we believe it's due to the simplicity of the pain check system and essentially removing removing guesswork and subjectivity from current practices. And I know um, Zita and Paula here today will be sort of exploring this a little bit more. Um, but before we go to that, just to sort of set the scene um, and in, in terms of how we're sort of how pain check has been um, well documented across the sector, we, 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 we've seen that there's been several peer reviewed validation studies completed by pain check. Clinical practice papers have also been uh, made available to clients. So there's, you know, some real evidence behind this. But we've also seen our regulators um, now taking interest in, 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 in pain check. And interestingly, the CQC have recently documented uh, pain check outcomes in their innovation hub, but also referencing it in their uh, state of care report, which highlights how pain check um, has enabled successful use of AI technology, specifically transforming dementia care. So hopefully this sort of sets the scene um, for the session today. Thanks, Tandy. And just fantastic, right? Some really good numbers in there, some fantastic benefits. And this is all off your mobile device, right? So I think in terms of ease for the layman, and if you've not seen this before, again, it's another mobile application, which is straight out. Use your mobile device, tablet device. It's there. It's so simple and, and convenient for, uh, for the end users. So thank you. So thanks, Tandy. Um, just covering off care control, right? So obviously we're hosting today. Why are we here? Who are we? And uh, a little bit about the, the the features of of what we do as a business. So care control itself, we understand, and we've we've uh, for a long 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 time now, a number of years, uh, recognised that the journey that we go on through life is unique. Uh, it can sometimes be full of challenges from a healthcare perspective. And at times we are going to need that help. Somebody's going to need to care from us. And so for us, it's really important that uh, you have your choice in, in where you receive that care, first and foremost, uh, and that you have the best. And, and our, our solution is, is very much about utilizing digital technology, which makes sure that that care is, is delivered in a, a personalized way, right? So in terms of an offering that we're able to give you as the, as the client, uh, as the resident, we're here again. We're here for everybody. We want to make sure that people have um, support throughout those different uh, critical health stages that we're all at some point going to experience. As a business, as well, uh, it's really important to recognise that Care Control itself. We're backed by the NHS. We are uh, an assured supplier, so we are uh, scrutinised. We are, are put through the rigorous process of making sure that our products and our solutions are basically rubber stamped by the NHS and that we are uh, an assured program. The product that we provide, the care control system, is it's all in one. It, it covers a multitude of uh, facets that are going to be important to your everyday care. Uh, and again, we'll cover that off as we move through the sections. Most of this, people go, well, how much is it? It's cost. It's going to be extra money to digitize. Well, obviously, we're looking to make sure that people save on their solutions and moving particularly through from a, a non-digitized solution. So if you're running on paper, that in itself can carry huge expense. So we want to make sure that we are looking at how we uh, provide those solutions around savings, not just through you know, capex costs, but also through efficiency. It's less admin. It's, it's, it's one of those things that I think many care homes see the realization when they change and go digital, that suddenly they see this, this huge amount of money that they've been spending, but not just the money, the time that they're able to put back into their, uh, their patient care. So for us, it's hugely important. 
Our product's fully customizable. We work with our, our customer base to make sure that the product is fit for them through the, uh, the training and implementation programs that we, we offer within the uh, onboarding process and throughout the support and lifestyle, life cycle of their particular uh, customer journey. We do trend analysis. We have uh, our analytics uh, dashboarding, which again helps carers to deliver the right level of service to maximize and capitalize on things like compliance and to make sure that, you know, you know when you're when you're being audited, the information is there at your fingertips. So as a system, yeah, absolutely. We're here to help support uh, both customers that want to turn to the uh, the digital process um, and those existing customers that we we already have on board. So I hope that outlines care control and who we are. So I'd like to introduce uh, Paula Cashmore. I, I would say, Paula, you need no introduction, right? So you are, as, as, you, as you rightly say, the, the Mary Poppins of care. So listen, I thought it'd be interesting, uh, Paula, you introduce yourself, uh, say hello to maybe the people that aren't familiar with you and, and those that are. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this webinar. I'm really keen to encourage um, digitisation in social care. I think it has amazing benefits. Um, I am a registered nurse. I've been in uh, social care for 40 years. I adopted the name of the Mary Poppins of social care when somebody said I'd got a lot in my bag. And that's probably because of the various roles that I've had from nurse. I've even been a carer when I uh, dropped my registration. Um, I've also done NHS inspections. I've been a registered manager. I've been a regional manager. But I've also got various voluntary roles. I work with the Voluntary Care Professional Register. I also work with Prince's Trust as a mentor, employability mentor, and with NACAS, the National Association of Care and Support Workers. So, as they say, a lot in my bag, um, but I'm very keen to work with providers and ensure good quality and good care because you can have good care without actually ticking the boxes and not being able to evidence for CQC. So having really efficient digital systems to support that evidence is important to me. Paula, you sound like you're extremely busy and that bag, it must be huge, right? it must be <laughs> huge. So uh, it's great to have you on, on the call today. Thank you so much for joining us, fantastic. Let me introduce you to, to Zita. Zita is our operations director for Angel Care and uh, MMS uh, Care. So I'm going to I'm going to say Zita, welcome to the webinar. Welcome. Thank you very much to inviting me to take part in this. I feel really passionately about digital care and making sure that our residents are advocated for. And one of the best ways we can actually do that is by making sure that we've got the appropriate tools in our toolkit. So I am a registered general nurse. I'm a registered mental health nurse and I have a master's in uh, nursing as well. I have been in social care in various guises since 1991, 92. I've been a nurse, I've been a deputy manager, I've been a registered manager, I've been regional compliance managers, I've been a quality manager, I've been an operations director, and I'm also the nominated individual at CQC for, for this company at the moment. So I have quite a wide specialism. I consider myself to be a psychiatric nurse, a mental health nurse, first and foremost. And, and Paula will probably attest to that's very much how I, I tend to think. So I'm very much for advocating for people who can't speak for themselves, who are not able to speak for themselves or who are disenfranchised from society or the care uh, pathway. So it's something that I hold quite, quite passionately about making sure that we deliver the best care even for people who who can't necessarily communicate that care or something that I picked up from earlier um, with what Tandit was saying in that people who don't always want to own that pain because they're they're either mm -hmm. very stoic or they're the war generation or they don't want people to see them as weak so sometimes people can articulate their pain but choose not to and that's why why pain check is such a great tool because it helps us overcome that as well. Thanks, Zita. Fabulous to have you. I feel, feel a little bit humbled, actually, given the level of knowledge and experience that we've got on the call with us today. And again, I'm not from a care background. 
uh, in my in my history. But again, it's great to have such fabulous individuals who've got such great knowledge with us uh, today to, to talk about that. So thank you. Great to have you here, ladies. Thanks for joining. So let's move on then um, and talk a little bit about how the AI and digital transformation technologies help us in dementia care. Obviously, we've got Tandeep here. Um, Tandeep, we've got some really good figures on here. Do you want to explain a little bit more about uh, about your your expertise and around the dementia side of uh, of pain check? Yeah, thank you, um, thank you, Marcus. That's um, that's great. Uh, so, look, you know, that I, I guess the statistic that I'm going to um, share with you is it, many of you may may know this already. Um, but a UCL-led study recently highlighted that um, the number of people living with dementia is set to sort of double to 1.7 million by 2040. And I guess, you know, that's a, that's a figure that that's quite worrying, actually, and quite troubling. Um, and it's going to have an impact right on on not just people living with dementia but their families and and i guess not to mention the impact that that will have on a i guess an already stretched health and um, social care workforce so i think we agree collectively right um that we need to be innovative in our approaches so whether that's the use of technology, whether that's changing the way in which we work as well. So it's not just technology. Um, it can be how we educate um, our, our people that uh, that are that essentially caring for others. But I think we agree collectively, we've got to really help people care better for other people, you know. And look, you know, five years ago, um, AI was really in its infancy and a lot's grown in that sector. And I, I would say on personal reflection, having worked in the NHS, you know, AI has been around. Um, but I think social care has got a massive opportunity here to take the learnings from NHS and it should bring that into social care. And let's do things really well with AI. And hopefully, you know, through this um session today, I can sort of relay some of the fears around AI as well. And, and you know, I, I, I speak to people regularly um, about the, the AI element. And one of the biggest things that come, comes out from it um, is that, you know, is AI going to take away our jobs, you know? And, 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 you know, I think, you know, where AI is best fitting in the sector and how it should be introduced to the sector as we bring more in, and something we've learned here at PainCheck is really to actually leverage AI, but not replace the individuals, not replace the carer. In fact, aid them, help them, you know, and in terms of with pain, helping them with the process of assessing pain, not actually replacing the face-to-face -face interaction with the resident. It's social care for a reason. You, you, you're not going to replace that face-to-face -face interaction within the sector. That that's that's so we, we feel this is the best way to 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 essentially bring AI into the sector. And look, you know, um where can AI help? Well, you know, from a carer perspective, you know, it can it can help take away those burdensome tasks. You know, it can it can support with better decision making. Um, and in particular, with pain check, our aim is to empower carers, regardless of their clinical background, to consistently identify pain. So these are some of the key areas I think we you know we really need to uh, explore when bringing AI in, but. It's 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 not just artificial intelligence. It's it's education. It's uh, it's the use of data and analytics, but it's also important that we have really good integrations as well, so that the AI is integrated with other digital clinical systems as part of that whole you know care eco technology ecosystem essentially. Um, so so for me. There's a few points I want to share today around sort of the integration that we've got with care control. And I think collectively, Marcus, I think you'll agree, right? When we set out on this journey together, I think the first thing we talked about was really to make it easier to care for people. Absolutely. Right. And when it comes to pain, um, essentially ensuring that families also feel reassured that their loved one is comfortable and not in pain. So I think these are some of the key um, aims that we want. And look, how can we do this? Well, you know, 
better documentation is important. It's important for many reasons. Of course, from a quality and governance point of view, it's important, but also from a communication point of view uh, and being able to learn from what you're what you're doing day in and day out and reflect on your practices. Documentation is really key, you know. Um, automation of processes. I mentioned earlier about removing tasks, making tasks quicker. If we can automate many processes, we're freeing up time for care. That's really key here. Um, but also when it comes to pain check being a medical device, it's also important that we've got the right data and we're digitally supporting diagnosis as well at the same time to make I guess, to, to help uh, clinicians, to help um, MDTs make better decisions. And, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's what Zeta mentioned earlier around people not being able to reliably report their pain means that often poorer decisions are made on, on someone's pain levels or pain, pain management. And actually, here's a tool that can really kind of help with that, you know. And so, and that's what we're seeing. So by accurately monitoring pain, uh, supported with our integration with care control, we will see profound outcomes. And, you know, some of the outcomes we're seeing for residents at the moment, which it has to be front and centre, is that, you know, we're seeing reductions in distress, you know, um, up to 40 percent in many case studies. Falls are reducing as well because people are are, are not in pain they're not as, uh, you know, they're, they're more mobile. Um, they've, they've got a little bit more confidence because, to, to walk because they're not in pain. It's that fear of falling, essentially, that relates pain to, to falls. Um, but a large client recently reported a reduction in serious injury up to 91%. Um, and people are on less medication and the right medication, namely psychotropics and analgesia. So these are sort of key areas that we're focusing on and getting some really good outcomes. Um, so we want to do more here. We're just touching the surface. And I think, you know, through the uh, integration we have and the work that we're doing with care control, we're aiming to really transform the way in which we deliver dementia care. And I, I think it's a really exciting prospect. Sandy, there's a couple of bits I love there, right? There's, there's two key buzzwords, I think. First one is about interacting, right? That for me is massively important because you know, that's what healthcare is about, isn't it? It's about getting the time, the opportunity to spend time doing the quality care. Um, and the other word you use there is about empowering. And that's just about empowering uh, the, both the staff, yeah, the individuals, giving people the confidence in this AI, right? Because that's a key, that's a key thing to overcome, right? People going through new technology, and, and I'm sure Paula and and uh, Zeta will give us some some insight around that in a minute about how we've integrated how that worked for them. But those two areas are really really important. And the key thing you just you said 91% right 91% reduction in in falls or accidents. I mean that's significant. That's that's a huge transformation in terms of using this piece of kit and um, you know helping people to to have less time. I mean less less documentation, less uh, less inefficiency in their workplace, and more time back on patients care so that's got to be an amazing thing so i think for me those takeaways are fantastic so thanks for sharing those so um i'm going to hand over to, to uh, zeta and, and paula to, to have a little chat so zeta you you've, you're going to kind of talk a little bit about you know you've gone through this process of integration be it with your know, care control uh customer using our product and then the integration with, with PainCheck. So it'd be really good to, to hear a little bit more about how that's been for you. And I know Paula and, and yourself have had some great experiences. So I'm going to drop the mic a minute and hand over to you two. Thank you. Um, when you when you try and roll out a new um, a new app or or, de or device or method, and I'm sure Paula will agree, sometimes you get a little bit of pushback from the staff. Um, because they they feel that it's another thing that they're being asked to do. Um, and one of the ways that, that we combated this was to try and get people on board, to try and get them to understand that this is something you have to do. And as well as, and if we get this right, it will mean that other things that we're having to do will sort of drop off. So... One of the things that, that that Paula and I have talked about is that how sometimes unrecognised or undiagnosed or, as I said earlier, unowned pain can sometimes cause the residents to act 
in distressed ways and sometimes we don't understand what the cause of that distress is quite often it's been found that it has been undiagnosed pain and one of the things that pain check allows us to do is to rule that out it's not only just ruling it in it's ruling it out so one of the things that that has been quite difficult for people to understand is that the old pain charts that we used to religiously use that this has been built upon that pain check has been built upon is very subjective um, and we're finding in practice that the subjectivity is removed by using the pain check tool what, what do you think about that that paula I think, you know, we agree on a lot of things, Zeta, and that's very important. And again, from my perspective, while looking at quality in care, that will match with a lot of the CQC um, quality statements. These, you know, medicines op optimization, the learning culture, as in your learning about your residents, safe systems and transitions effectiveness assessing their need all these are really basic things that cqc are trying to capture and you've got those in electronic evidence when you're using pain check do you think paula that that fits very well into the new quality um, statements under the new single assessment quality framework that cqc are partially rolled out across across the country yes um i think in looking at everything all the evidence that we have been talking about it let me let me count the amount of quality statements there are eight safe statements that it, um and out of the eight quality safe quality statements it fits into four of them out of the effective there are also four that it will fit into there are five caring statements that it also covers. Um, it covers six responsive statements and two of the well-led statements. When you've got one digital um, app that covers so many of those quality statements, it's easy to see what benefits AI brings to dementia care. I think one of the things that that is really interesting is that even though we're talking about dementia care, it's far, far wider reaching than that. Um, mm -hmm. Because as I mentioned earlier, there are some people who don't want to own their pain for, for whatever mm -hmm. reasons, whether that's personal reasons, pride, they don't want their family to know that they're suffering, mm -hmm. religious reasons, spiritually reasons. Um, or that's just how they've been brought up, that we don't complain, we just get on and do. And one of the things that we have noticed is that this is picking up that pain level. And then it's how then we as skilled practitioners and we how, how we empower our nurses to be able to have those clinical conversations with those residents and with the GPs in cooperation to make sure that their prescribed analgesia is correct it's not too strong it's not too mild and then what we found from when we're doing regular pain checks on people is i'm a bit of a stats and, a, and an info geek as, as paul paula knows i i love looking at these types of things but it gives you a nice uh visual representation of what the pain is doing for that resident and that can be shared um in care reviews um with relatives residents gps uh, the mental health team um or any the chc team uh, for reviewing nhs funded elements of care and it's a very clear indicator of what their pain is doing. And one of the things we have started to look at is if their pain is settled and constant, do we need to review the, the analgesia? Because maybe the analgesia that they're having is maybe too strong and we, we can review that. And that goes hand in hand with reducing the other symptoms that some residents can have as a cause of having to have a strong analgesia. Would you, would you mm -hmm. think that is fair or? <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, it does. It incorporates so many things, doesn't it? And one of the effective quality statements where staff teams work together, you know, is to work effectively across teams to support people, making sure they only need to tell their story once. And when you've got that data that can give that information to GPs or to hospitals, then that covers the fact that that resident doesn't need to be sharing and discussing their pain all the time. I think this is really important because both Paula and I are very strong advocates of working collaboratively with everybody across the health and social care network. And, and we are quite proud to champion social care as being the excellent care mm. provision that it can be. And Paula and I do feel very strongly about this. And we are forever trumpeting that we work in social mm. care and social care is great and social care needs to be recognised for all the great and wonderful things that that we do. And I think the, incorp the incorporation of this type of technology is clearly demonstrating that we're we're willing and we're wanting mm -hmm. to develop and to provide a good rounded holistic service for those who are in our care mm -hmm. and that by sharing the information that these tools that are not subjective have gleaned and given us the data to be able to really clearly evidence that we are treating the person as a whole and when mm -hmm. you think about the the cqc I and we statements and the I statements that are the statements that are coming from the, the resident. Um, it is very much about them having a control and an empowerment and an integration with their care across their entire care pathway. So as Paula said, it gets very repetitious where you have to keep yes. saying the same <laughs> thing to everybody all the time. And we're hoping that this new um, this new framework and, and the development of that will, will assist residents to be able to have a seamless journey through, across, back in, through and out of health and social care providers and um, services. And we what we have found is that because it is on a handheld device and it is an app, because we use care control and we have care control on our handheld devices, they're not having to carry something separate with them. They can be both loaded onto the same device. The care control system allows us to set alerts that are bespoke for each individual resident, depending on their pain need. So we can set up as many um, alerts for us to check somebody's pain as we want. We can do more than that. Um, and anybody and everybody can use it. We've moved away very much from the nurses doing it at the medication round to the to the care staff and all staff doing it at any time. And I think that's when it's really important because once you've got the consent uh, within your um, residence folders, files, care plans, care control, to assess them and treat them for care, the pain check can be used so seamlessly in a group environment without them being singled out and having to sit there at the table and ask the resident, are you in pain? They're not going to want to necessarily own that in front of their resident sat at the table in front of them. So it's not the most dignified approach. Being able to do the pain check discreetly, as long as we've got consent, it gets rid of a lot of that as well if you're just using certain elements of it. And I think that's really, really powerful because people don't necessarily want to own their pain. Mm. Um, and nurses, Paula and I are nurses, and we can say this, do sometimes have a habit of asking questions um, when it's not the most confidential or dignified um, area to ask those questions. What do you think about that, Paula? Yeah, and I think, like you said about people that can't articulate or won't own their pain, um, again, CQC are looking for um, equality in access and treating people um, uh, person-centred. So it's not just dishing out paracetamol four times a day or even stronger painkillers because previously people have been in pain. You can check. Um, so it it helps the whole NHS from um, a prescribing point of view, a GP time, practice nurse time, all of those things. And especially in social care, giving that individual assessment. 
And your point about anyone can do pain check with it being with the carers. Again, you are empowering your workforce, you're encouraging development, you're encouraging knowledge. So, you know, good use of AI is is essential to have a, a well-trained uh, workforce. And I think moving on from that, um, Paula, as well, is I know that we've discussed this previously, where we have um, some, obviously coming from a mental health nurse perspective, we have um, some residents who, when they're admitted to our care homes, um, have a lot of um, a, a lot of medication prescribed and, and quite often it falls to the care home to sort of go through and review that as part of the new admission process for the resident. And there's quite a lot of residents who are prescribed multiple medications that we're not quite sure what the indication for those are. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've anecdotally started to, to pick up is that some of our mental health clients um, are prescribed quite strong analgesics and we're, we're questioning where and what that is actually for. And there is a question um, around whether or not they're they're wanting to have those medications to to self-medicate for their mental health needs or because they've got their you know they've got used to them and they can't live without them and it, it's something they have fit, made their mental health concerns into a physical concern and that's yeah. how it's manifesting themselves and that and knock, yeah that knock-on effect again is as cqc says we want to support people to live healthier lives and to manage their health and well-being. And so, again, you're looking at the quality statements and effective use of, of the analgesia, of the medication that, that people need, um, because they specifically say in the quality statements, where possible, reduce their need for care and support. I think one of the things anecdotally that we're starting to find is that when we've got a body of evidence that we can present, we can quite clearly question whether or not this analgesia is prescribed at the appropriate level and whether that can therefore be reduced. And we can look for other other ways and, and attempts to manage their mental health needs, be that different type of talking mm. therapies or different types of support within within the care setting to help to wean them off the dependency that some of the people um, have had through through um, strongly prescribed analgesia and then conversely at the other end of um, the health and social care scale where you've got people who are end of life where you wouldn't be even considering really dosing your aim is to make them comfortable and content and relaxed and again I would I haven't used this um in reality, but I'm hoping that we will do at some stage that we would be able to very, very clearly evidence if their end of life um, pain management isn't appropriate Sorry. and we might need to have that upped. And I think it will be really powerful in that. I haven't we haven't managed to do that yet. And I'm hoping that if we, we come back and revisit this so many months down the line, that I might have some evidence that that might have happened as well. And I think that's going to be really powerful because end of life care is so absolutely mm. vitally important for our residents. And, it, and it's something that we um, need to advocate for. How, how do you feel about that, Paula? Yeah, I'm fully with you, Zita. I'm fully with you. I thought you would be somehow. <laughs> um, I don't think I've got anything else that I'd really like to, um, to say, but anybody who is thinking of rolling out either electronic care plans you're going to go through pain before you you get to the end result and you know you will it is worth it at the end anybody thinking of rolling out pain check within electronic care plans again it's how you sell it and present it to your team it's how you you show them the, what the benefits of it are and if you're signed up to it the team will pick that up off you and that that's absolutely fine um and don't be frightened of it because AI, there's been so much in the news recently about AI and all the stuff that's going on in America with all, all the socials and all that type of thing. This is this is where it works really, really well mm -hmm. because it's giving those very slight cues that you can't always pick up. And it's really quite clearly evidencing that this is something that's really, really positive. And I'm sure as we move further on, there'll be more um things like this coming along 
and it's not it's not going to replace our jobs. This is a big thing. Is AI going to replace our jobs? It's not going to replace our jobs in this respect. It's an adjunct to it. And it's a tool that gives us something to very, very clearly evidence what we're saying to prescribers and also people who manage people's care from a social perspective. And I personally think that's really powerful. So to kind of jump in, I'm just going to, I'm just, it's more of a statement, right, or, or a question to, to you, especially. You've gone through this process of integration. You've gone through uh, using pain check with, with care control. Firstly, I love the passionate way you, you talk about and describe this. So for me, seeing this transformation that you've gone through and seeing, I suppose you talked at the start of this conversation about using old pain charts and that being quite subjective, right? So that's based on people seeing and, and believing what, they're, what they've got in front of them. Moving to this digital platform, right, where it takes away that subjectiveness. How would you describe that transition for people that are actually administering this, this uh, product? How, how would you describe the team, your, your team that went through that? What, would their, what was their behaviors like? Did they, did they feel uplifted? Was there trepidation? How did, how did that transformation work for you? Had different. Um, we we had different things in different care homes. One of our care homes was very. We're having our nurses doing it, and our nurses are doing it. And I didn't want to go with that. And and that's what they started with. And then it's branched out from there. In some of our other care homes, where we've got very engaged carers, as Paula, Paula was talking about, who who want to learn and grow and develop their roles. They just took to it like a duck to water in, in one of our care homes. It was like, well, hey, look, look at this. Yeah. And they were sort of like, you know, really interested in it. So I think a lot of it is is how it is led by the manager in the home um, and what type of service it is. We have very different different services we have some services that are very very general health care end of life focused and we have some services that are mental health and, and dementia focused some services that are a mix so some homes have embraced it and it's just run it's just run fabulous and, and i'm going on and checking because obviously i get an overarching um picture of of the of what's happening in the homes and I can see, oh, oh, that's a care assistant, that's a senior care assistant, oh, that, that's a nurse, that's a, you know, so you can see that um, integration. So mixed, but I think that, that's that's health and social care, isn't it? It's very, very mixed. Um, the, the couple of homes that set it off recently, they think it, they, they, they think it's easy, they love it. They actually feel it saves time in the long run. Um, and also, as Paul was saying about the quality statements, it shows very, very clearly that we're looking at it from a from a whole perspective. I know, I know Tandeep said it takes a couple of minutes. It doesn't even take that, to be fair. It doesn't even take that. Instant, um, yeah. Yeah, well, it's not quite instant, but, but you, yeah, you know, in, as people in, the, get in the new scheme, in this it, but compared to doing the old, the old, uh, you know, pain charts, it's it's radically, you know, in terms of the percentage you gain back, right, must be hugely beneficial. It is absolutely, and I think because it is on an app and it's in their pocket, and they've got care control in their pocket as well, it makes it easier because they're not having to go to the Mar chart go and find a pain chart. It's all just there and they just click on it and go. Fabulous. Some really clear benefits there around the quality care that we are able to deliver from this. So thank you so much, ladies, for uh, for talking about that. Obviously, we're gonna we're just gonna kind of I suppose frame that and and bring everybody into this discussion now around you know how this uh, especially Paula because I know this is an area you're you're passionate about in terms of CQC how it fits. You've already mentioned some of those statements where it fits. You know we had uh, fifty percent I think on the first one five out four five and you you were talking about numbers. Let's just talk very briefly about how this fits in and uh, you know in terms of the the safe, the caring, well led, responsiveness, effective. Is there any commentary we want to add around this? Maybe areas that we haven't covered off about how this fits under the CQC uh, quality? Paula, I'd, I'll lead with uh, you. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm pleasantly surprised how one app doing one thing that you may think, oh, I don't want another app just doing one thing. I need to incorporate hundreds of things. Care control is excellent at what it delivers in its care planning, in its risk assessment, in all of its audits. It's absolutely fabulous. One of the reasons I'm very happy to endorse care control as a care planning tool is because of its comprehensiveness. With pain check, 
sometimes people look at it and think it's a one-off thing I'm not going to invest in that one-off thing but for something that just just checks pain it absolutely covers all of the uh, key questions. There are quality statements that it will go into. The I statements, it will support with the I statements. I'm treated with dignity and respect. As Zeta says, you're not going up to somebody at each medication round saying, what's your pain like? Where's your pain? And having a full blown confidential conversation at the medication trolley. You can have that quick um, press of a button to assess and then you have far fewer questions when you're asking about analgesia. Um, so from a from a quality perspective, it's obviously a very good tool and it gives excellent feedback, which again, as Zeta says, has a real knock on effect within the environment. If you're managing people's pain, you will be managing a lot more as well. It's, it, it, as well you say, Paula, isn't it? It's about understanding and trying to rule out mm -hmm. causes of distressed behaviour because distressed behaviour is an unmet need. Mm -hmm. And an unmet need can be physical, it could be psychological, it, it could be spiritual. It, it, it's an unmet need. And we need to understand what that unmet need is, mm -hmm. which I think, you know, as you say, it goes it goes across everything, doesn't it? Really, it goes across all the the key key lines. Not don't have key lines of inquiry anymore. Key questions it goes now. Key questions now. Yes. Um, and it, like you say, I think it's very reassuring that it sits within all the five main domains. Thanks, Zeta. Thanks, Paula. Tandy, from your perspective, is there anything you want to touch on around the uh, the quality statements from uh, yeah. from a high check? I think it's um, it goes back to what Paula said earlier. Really, is is around um, you know pain check is 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 guess more than just an app. You know, it's it's it's, it's driving um, outcomes. It's supporting various um, you know um, quality statements. But but for me, pain check is a system, right? So it's the app. It's the it's the point of care application that you know really helps the carer empowers the carer to do assessments there and then and to zeta's point in in a dis, in discreet way but it's there and then we're not we're not ha having to sort of wait for a nurse or, or wait for a senior to come and do an assessment we can do it there and then when it's needed most so responsive is really key here you know from that respect um the analytics, the data, we talk about data, but da data is only good if it's it makes sense and it, if it comes together. And I think what we do through Pain Check is provide the portal, the data analytics portal, um, which supports with not just identifying pain trends um, over a period of time. So it helps with decision making. But actually, one of the unique areas is we're collecting data on individuals here so we can individualize pain uh, management, okay, by really identifying how an individual's in pain cues differ from one another. So you can develop, you know, uh, profiles on individuals and really understand how that individual communicates their pain, because the way I would communicate my pain may be different to Zeta, you know, um, we're all individual. And it's a highly personal experience pain. So therefore, we need to be able to support us driving better decisions by individualizing it. And, you know, when we talk about person-centered care, this is what it's all about. It's about individualizing, but it's also about really understanding. And something that Paula mentioned earlier, um, and, and Zeta was around, um, you know, being able to rule in, rule out pain, you know, um, so you can kind of really understand what's going on underneath, because it's not just pain that may be causing the distress. There may be others. But unfortunately, sometimes we just can't get past that first base, which is, is this person in pain or not? Mm -hmm. So truly person centred care is really understanding the person living behind the dementia. And that's probably where I leave it. Thanks, Tandy. Great stuff. Um, I, I think I think just kind of 
we're coming to the close now of, of uh, this this particular webinar. I think for me, some of the key takeaways from this conversation, A, it's been super informative, and I'm sure we all agree that particularly the people on the call, I've, I always learn something when I speak to you guys. Uh, it's fabulous to just hear your experiences, all of you from your backgrounds. It's super powerful as well for our audience. You know, I'm hoping that, uh, that the people watching this absolutely understand the fact that actually we'll see massive benefits if they want to use uh, both care control uh, a pain check as an integrated tool that for us is is the is the benefit that we're looking for we want to bring this quality care to people's doorsteps so you know the data the transformation around uh, managing people's pain all of this is fantastic and um, I hope that for you the audience that have been watching today uh, you've, you've learned something and you're keen to progress so for me on behalf of, uh, of the care control team uh, pain check Paula and Zito I just want to say a massive thank you for joining us today thank you very much thank you thank you Brilliant. Thank you, Marcus. Um, again, thank you very much for joining us today for this very insightful session. I know I've learned a lot and it's it's always great talking with with you guys. Um, you're very knowledgeable people and it's um, great to share this with everyone. Um, I want to say a special thank you to Paula and Zita for your contributions today. It's been a pleasure having you with us. Um, on behalf of the entire care control team and pain check, we want to say a huge thank you. Uh, to our viewers, we hope that today's webinar has been informative and insightful. For those of you ha who have signed up, please be on a lookout in your inbox for further information related to today's topics. Um, we'll be sharing details on pain check, care control and a link to Paula's business, Achievable Care Quality. If you'd like to stay up to date with all things tech and care related, please follow us on our social media platforms, which we will have linked in our description below. Again, thank you for joining us. And if you have any further questions um, or you'd like any information, please contact us at sales at carecontrolsystems.co.uk. Thank you for tuning in.